Hi, everyone. It's about one o'clock. Um, we're going to give it a couple of minutes. There's some folks that are still uh, popping in here, so I'm going to delay just a second. Uh, on today's call, the, the, today's webinar, webinar we're going to be uh, maybe mixing it up a little bit differently from previous labs for those that have attended um, in the past. Uh, we're going to go through some of the questions that you all had, but there was a, a very important question on redlining and equity um, that, that we want to address and talk about. Um, and so I have uh, my colleague, uh, Josh McCarty, um, in on this call. Josh has done some very important redlining analysis. There's Josh. Um, in uh, Kansas City, Kansas, and South Bend, and in, num in numerous other places. This is a topic that's very prescient today uh, in, in, in uh, today's movement, particularly with the, um, the murder of George Floyd and all of the uh, 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 issues that have come to bear um, in every community. And um, this really needs to be talked about and brought forward. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. Um, and uh, as, as always, the rules of the, uh, of the presentation in this lab, uh, Josh and I are going to go through uh, some of our work and answer the questions. Um, if you all have comments or want to ask any questions, we're going to have the, the second half of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of this lab is a kind of, I call it PowerPoint DJ, where I'll be taking the, the questions. Uh, my colleague Kate Ryba is, is on uh, this side of the, of the webinar as well. She'll be fielding the questions and she'll take over in leading um, the direction of the, of, of, of the DJ session um, in the second half. So we, we do intend this to be a very interactive um, a presentation, but we want to get to your questions first because, because you all asked. Um, so with that, I think we've got enough time. There's just a couple more people popping in here. Um, but this is a pretty good uh, a chunk of folks from the from the waitlist, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So let me share my screen. So let's see. Can you all see my screen, Kate? Do we have the right screen up? No, we can't see it. We just see you. Oh. Well, that's it, it, cool. popped, it popped up and then it disappeared. How's that? No, How's sorry. That? Okay, that's all right. I probably did something wrong here. There we go. We're seeing traffic economics. Do you see full screen? Let's see. Yes, you're on. I'm on. Okay. So just to go back through real quick, uh, you just heard Kate. Um, she's going to moderate the conversation at the at the back end with Q and A. Um, but first, we're going to get through some of the questions. Uh, some of the questions were actually very detailed, um, and uh, but very good questions nonetheless. So there's uh, one one of the questions that came in was um, how to volunteer in your community um for teenagers um one highly recommended is as a teenager as a college student um get involved uh, there's lots of different ways to do that um you know i don't know the the infrastructure in the twin cities in specific um but start with a uh, find nonprofits that are doing work in the space where you're interested so if you're interested in community design or or, or matters of uh, social equity um, you can probably find, and particularly in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities area, uh, you can find um, those resources and they, they could definitely use your support and work. Um, also try uh, city staff um, and, uh, um, and, and Kate recommended um, Commissioner Tony Carter at Ramsey County. She has deep, deep roots in the community. Um, she's also got a long tenure of service in the community. So, so folks like that would know who the the active players are. So for anybody on the webinar, just uh, for your kids, for yourself, for your friends, uh, get involved and uh, help your community move forward. And nonprofits are a great place to start for that. Um, one of the other questions was about a highway conversion. What do, you, do we have an example of what that means, uh, a right-of-way conversion, and how to explain that? And, and we actually have a great project here in Asheville with the I-26 um, uh, retrofit. So there's a 
I-26 and 240 right here come through town, they drop onto a local road and then they peel off and head north right here. And it's kind of a silly thing. Um, the community has been working with DOT for 30 years, maybe 40, um, trying to get this alignment fixed. Uh, I was part of a, of a group called the Asheville Design Center and we came up with an alternative. And one of it was also to basically look at when you when you bend the 240 northward, you get all of this right of way left over. You can actually rebuild Patton Avenue to what it used to be and claim back um, a considerable amount of right of way. Um, we did drawings, we did analysis. There's a bunch of architects, landscape architects, planners. Uh, we worked as a team to basically look at that right of way infrastructure and then offer a, a, a design solution. I think using the visuals is really helpful for folks, not only just from above to see the buildings, but also at the ground level. This is the current highway. And then once you take the highway off that and you have all this basically extra space for, for transit and bike lanes and everything else, and you can still have car flow. Now, the other thing that was important was explaining to folks what it means financially. So as the architects were drawing buildings and, and laying things out, um, I just basically built a spreadsheet to figure out and estimate the the uh, the costs and, and revenues of all this stuff. So basically, here's all the square footages, and this is the the valuation. Now, now by the way, we also threw a new civic center in just for the heck of it. So it wasn't just purely uh, uh, taxable real estate. We actually saved space for affordable housing, artist space. But when you when you run the numbers on that, that's you know think about this. No one touches a high for about 50 years so our lost opportunity of not putting those buildings there is about 111 million dollars of lost taxes to the city the county and the school system that number should be out there in the analysis so talking to our community it's like yes we're getting involved with a highway the dot of course is not i'm gonna be honest they're not the greatest to work with when it comes to cooperation um because they don't see the land use as part of their role yet they're affecting land use um, you know, here we are, I think we did the design in, that you see here on the left in 2007, and, and here's the current roadway. And you can see how they've like maximized the turns, they've got all this sweeping infrastructure. Uh, just, just two weeks ago, we were having a design conversation about how to utilize this space and this space, and we pointed out to the engineers the lack of crosswalks in here, or how would somebody crosswalk across this thing? And the engineer basically said, well, I wouldn't advise that. And we're like, we're going to have buildings here and here. I mean, you've got the sidewalk. You can see it in red. And he's like, oh, yeah. So here we are 20 years into it. And they don't remember any of that stuff. The other thing that's kind of frustrating as a taxpayer is this is the economic analysis report. And let's just go ahead and read it. This is it. This is the entire economic effect of a billion dollar project. And, you know, obviously we say we want this right of way back because Asheville can ex expand right of way. And or, or, or sorry. Uh, can expand its real estate. Our, our boundary is locked. So every square foot of real estate in our community is critically important for our tax base. But they're saying that, oh, if you don't get to use it, maybe a 6% loss of your total value, in this case, 1%. So so what's 1% of tax value? So why didn't they just explain that to us? I mean, it's real simple. You can pull the value of Asheville. Asheville's worth 14 billion. So 1%, is about an opportunity of $140 million. So why don't you tell my elected officials that we could lose $140 million worth of tax value, which equals, you know, cutting a check for $84 million over 50 years. Can we afford that? And that's on the low end. I mean, it's $140 million. I don't believe that at all. You know, it's, it's, here's a really simple way to kind of measure that. So, so here's, the, here's the new Patton Avenue. Just taking this one project that just got built right here, the Delray Apartments, there it is. It's worth 17.5 million. You can fit about 10 of them in there. So that's about 175 million. So where did you come up with this 140 million? That's not even a, you know, I wouldn't call it an excellent piece of architecture that's really urban. It's it's nice, it's, it's, it's fitting, but we can do so much better. In fact, we drew it. And so here's, here's the, the, the numbers we gave them in 2007 and we showed them at 700 million back then. It's gotta be at least a billion by now. So, so how is it that we gave you the math, we have examples nearby, but then you lowballed it with 140 million. So I, I think 175 to a billion is greater than uh, 140 million. Or let's be honest with the citizens and run the numbers on that. So let's just say 
from our estimate to their estimate, that's like about an $860 million difference. Or let's be honest with our politicians and tell them that the city of Asheville and Buncombe County is cutting a check for $516 million over 50 years in lost taxes. So let's go ahead and see that in here. Not this just random 1% stuff, but let's be honest with the citizens and say, you know, Asheville, Buncombe County will lose about 84 million, but up to over 500 million in local taxes over 50 years because NCDOT has prioritized moving cars fast. And, or the other thing we could do is let's just trade it off. What are we, what are we paying for? Well, it's basically a two minute, two minute difference in peak delay time. So basically here's the, here's the traffic flow. And I wanna use, uh, I wanna give credit to Jeff Tumlin. Uh, he used to be with Nelson Nygaard this day to explain. This is how transportation systems work. This is how roads are used. There's a, there's a peak it, it, in, in the morning commute. Um, but what, they're, what the engineers try to do is minimize this little overcapacity here called a level of service F. Like all of a sudden, oh, we've got a traffic delay for a couple hours out of the day. And let's go ahead and widen the highway or increase speeds or do everything else. So we're essentially paying for just a little bump right there and then wasting an incredible opportunity with extra resources. So if we just move this line down a little bit, so, okay, so we have more people in congestion, but is it worth $516 million? I think so. I think my community would enjoy $516 million more taxes for the school system, the parks, the greenways, and all of that. So a, a, another paired question that goes with this from, from the audience is, you know, what do I think about traffic projections from engineers? Well, I, I, I agree with Jane Jacobs. Jake, Jane Jacobs. I mean, she nailed it on the head. Traffic engineering is a bogus profession and it's a pseudoscience masquerading as knowledge. I 100% agree. In fact, when I, I was in the meeting and I said to the engineer that it's just, you know, bogus numbers, he got, a, he got pissed at me. And I'm like, all right, let me just show you your numbers. So here's the actual trips in 1980. And in 1980, we actually, uh, we had a summer intern that uh, uh, Mari Gurisanti who pulled all of the numbers. So here's here's the first projection that he made, 54,000 trips on 240. So they're like, this is the future of Asheville. Well, we can go back and look at this. That was their guess of what we'd be at 1995. Let's just straight line project that to show you what that trend looks like. But here's the actual, we actually have the data. And then in 1995, they did another projection and they're like, oh, actually the future is gonna be out here at, in 2020 at 68,000. Um, so here's what actually happened. Then for some reason in 2003 or 2002, they made another projection that's way the hell up here at 143,000. How, when you, just by looking at this chart, like how can you take them seriously that these are their projections? In fact, the city engineer, Anthony Butzek at the time called BS on that and said, that's, you know, that's just kind of crazy. Um, but you know, the, the trips kept going. Two years later, they adjusted their number down to 99,000. I mean, none of these look close to what's actually happening um, in the system. So this was their, their projection back up there in 2010. And again, does any of this make sense? How can you take this seriously? I, I think this is just bogus. Here's what's actually happening. So Mari, you know, we just collected all of the data and we said, let's just go ahead and guess forward. Let's just take the last 12 years and project forward um, based on the trend. And that's what we did. Now, here's what's been, what's kind of fun. Mari did this in 2014. So now we actually have trips that have actually happened. And you can see here's the, the 2015 read and here's the 2017 read. We are actually closer to guessing future demand by basically using fifth grade math than whatever system that DOT is using. Uh, you know, a summer intern has done a better job than all the professionals that we pay for. And they've gone ahead and they've adjusted their projection to down to here. So it's like, all right, well, you're actually dialing it down. But how are you getting this number? You know, are, are you just hiring our, you know, North Carolina's favorite psychic medium and healer, Gary Spivey? Is, does Gary just work for NCDOT now and, and make up all the numbers and projections? Like, where are you getting these numbers? And it just blows my mind that we take this stuff seriously. And we're dealing with impacts on a community that my community is gonna lose $800 million because of this bogus math. Now, the other thing is, why isn't DOT looking at their past performance to see these things that I just showed you? How are they not doing this stuff? You know, in fact, actually, I, I'll, let's just stick on this graphic for a second. If, if you, uh, Nate Silver's book, um, Signal Through the Noise, he, he walks through how you do weather projections. And that the, the the meteorology industry won't use 
they won't use data beyond 48 hours because it's too unpredictable. And they use thousands of computers running hundreds of mathematical models to come up with the next 48 hours worth of weather projections. So that they're actually rely on. But DOT is just using one model. So how is it that we're going to rely on your science to project 20 years out when a million things can change in 20 years? And we're going to take your number as some sort of fact when we won't even do that with weather. I mean, that just blows my mind. So, so how do people not see this math? And you know, frankly, we, there's a behavior quirk. Most people don't like doing math. And I'll give you a quick little example of that. Um, this is one of my favorite stories in Indiana. Um, Indiana started charging people 40 to 50 bucks a month to ride the bus. And this is an NPR story where they interviewed this guy, Jeff Bennett. And Jeff's complaining that he has to sit in a car half hour a day to drop his kid off or every way, each way. Um, to get his kid to school. So, okay, let's let's check Be Jeff Bennett's math skills for a second. Jeff spends 30 minutes each way. So that means um, Jeff spends about an hour a day, which, you know, let's say he's doing this every day to drop his kid off, that's 20 hours a month. Uh, so if Jeff were making the average hourly rate in Indiana, that's about $28 an hour. So Jeff is spending $560 a month to drop his kid off. So Jeff is spending $560 to save 40. Or another way of looking at this, Jeff loses $520 a month. I mean, it's just like, this isn't hard math to do, yet he's not even running that. Now, let's just say Jeff is 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 a, is a lower wage worker. Let's say Joe, look, he's not an average person. He needs to count his pennies because he's poor. All right, well, poverty rate is $10 an hour. So that means Jeff is spending $200 a month to drop his kid off to save $40. Or another way of putting it is Jeff loses $160 a month. So this isn't this isn't hard math to do. Even the the DOT math isn't even that difficult to do. It's just having the patience to go through this, put it down on a piece of paper, and work it out. We can we can do this math. Um, but I find that a lot of folks just they just relate on relate to their biases or their their heuristics rather than run the numbers. And and what's crazy in this story that the biggest thing that's most telling is let's just deal with the issue, which is Jeff's son can't walk to school because there's no sidewalks. Can we just put a sidewalk down? You know, you know, it's just we're not seeing how our physical environment is being shaped by these decisions because people are being, I don't know, lazy with their math or they're just operating on heuristics and biases. And in fact, one of the biggest problems is confirmation bias, that you have DOT engineers that are only seeing this for moving traffic flow and they're not being open and honest about what the impact is to a community. And I have community leaders that aren't bothering with the math. Um, you know, it's, I've got counselors that are basically involved in this, city counselors, and they're not seeing the effect on our city because they're viewing this from a political lens rather than from an economic lens. And confirmation bias, one of my favorite ways to explain this is the John Powell graphic where he put all of the, uh, the, the peer-reviewed climate uh, change uh, articles in, into a chart with those that reject climate change, which are in red. And yet there are still people on this planet that will point to those 24 articles and tell me that I'm wrong. You know, it's just let's just look at the data and see that the overwhelming mountain of evidence is against those 24 papers. I mean, I'll, I'll, let's look at the criticism. We need to be open minded about it. But sooner or later, there's data and evidence that we should be making adult decisions with. So. Um, one of the other questions uh, is, uh, and getting back, getting closer to where uh, I'm going to intro Josh here, uh, the biggest takeaways from the CNU. Um, the CNU was awesome this year. It was digital. It was online. It was a little difficult that way, but it was still the 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 the, um, the Congress feel was still there. We were there was a lot of dialogue and debate, but also because of what what's happening um, happening in the world. Uh, it pivoted toward issues of COVID, COVID and uh, uh, racism, redlining, urban renewal, and equity. That every session um, was real and dealt with the issues and in in true CNU fashion, adapted and discussed things. This wasn't about being safe and in, in hiding information. It was about pulling the pulling the scab off and seeing what happened. Um, I thought this year's CNU was very, very uh, good with that. So it's hard to pin on one one conf, uh, one session because many sessions, uh, actually all the sessions, um, brought that out, including 
the makeup of the panels uh, is a predominance of white males um, on the panels and in, in the community of the CNU um, and how to expand the voice of, of, uh, of those that aren't being heard. So I, I, would, I really enjoyed it, um, but for me, the, 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 the most important um, uh, a discussion it came around uncovering redlining and before I pass it off to off to Josh, I want to just explain for those of you that don't know what redlining is. Uh, redlining is essentially a, a a a reference to housing maps that were paired up with the National Housing Act of 1934. So basically, the federal government moved into securitizing mortgages or were underwriting them basically or protecting them, and they left it up to communities to come up with a grading system in their community of what's a good investment and what's a bad investment. It, Put simply, but it was basically came down to four grades of good environment, or good investment, desirable investment. Maybe it's a declining neighborhood or hazardous, which is basically like don't we're not going to underwrite mortgages in those areas. They're essentially eliminating funding in communities. But you can see every city, and these are all self-created at a local level. So it wasn't like the federal government was going in and doing this. These were self-inflicted wounds at a local level but they still underwrote it as a federal policy. So you can see that in a place like Birmingham, Alabama, they redlined a lot more of their community than let's say Rochester did. Um, but with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Josh. Make sure I don't mess up again. So yeah. Josh, can you take it over from here? Yeah, and I'll pop back okay. in when you're done with redlining. Okay, so we got a audio check, you can hear me? Video check and let me share screen. Uh, don't know where the button is to share screen. Let's see, it should be just under your camera button. Let me, or I can just let me just, I'll, I'll, it looks like you got it. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, it's a little different interface than I'm used to, and I bet it switched the screen. So now we should be, are we on presentation mode? You're good, yep. Okay. Okay, so I had this, uh, the, the idea for, for doing this, this talk and this analysis, I think for me started back when I, I, I saw this model about six years ago. And so I intentionally, so this is one of our 3D tax models. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know what they're looking at right now, basically taller, and warmer colors is uh, more tax productivity. And I did this model. And one, one of the things I love about this, uh, doing the work in this way, is that without knowing really anything about the place you're looking at, you can already start to uh, make some some inferences about the history and the uh, the, the uh, urban fabric of the place. And so I've intentionally left off all the labels so that you could see something that that I see, and, and I bet a lot of people are trying to guess what city it is, but uh, when I first did this, I thought there's something wrong with this data. This doesn't look, this doesn't look right. It looks engineered. Um, and so I'll, uh, I'll ask you this question, which is whether you can guess which parts of this city uh, were, were redlined and which parts are majority not white. So I'll just go ahead and give you the answer. So this is Buffalo. So this is Buffalo, it's facing from Lake Erie looking at Buffalo, so north is to the left. And uh, you can kind of see what's going on under there where there are definitely parts of the city that um, that have a big difference in value. So what's going on under there is that this is the redlining map that Joe was just talking about. And uh, and this is what happened to Buffalo. Uh, they, they, they carved it up into these sections and they got different grades. And now, years later, we can see the outcome of what that means. So there are a few different ones. Um, you can see that the non-white, majority non-white parts of the city were the parts that were redlined and they're the parts that are suffering from these really suppressed property values. And so the question that that led us to is, can we use that gap in value to actually put a price tag on redlining to figure out, just as Joe was talking about, uh, the cost over 50 years from that foregone real estate from the highway, can we think about that foregone tax revenue to the city from these suppressed values? And so I'll bring this graphic up again. Um, 
Uh, when I did this be before, there was an entire other section on redlining. Redlining was 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 very much a part of, of most of the discussions at the Congress for New Urbanism. I think it's a, a on the forefront of, of all, our, all of our minds who are in planning, who already know some of this history, but I think it's gonna be, I think we're gonna see an exercise in the next year or so in, in lots of education about this so that, I, I don't know how prevalent this story is for the American public, but it should be because it helps us understand why our cities look the way they look now. And really redlining is just a shorthand. It's, it's got really good branding with these colors and these letters and these grades and the outcomes that it had in our cities but it's really it's so much bigger than just redlining there's a whole constellation of racist policies that uh the united states and american cities engaged in that, that gave us the the cities that we have now so i'll make a couple important points about redlining that that uh that i want to make which is one is that this is pervasive i mean you saw this so sorry this is mapping inequality which is a great place to start just to see the maps i think if you want to really there's some good accessible uh, resources out there. If you want a book, Mapping Inequality is a good book. It gets into this. There's also a video that goes with that book that's a nice, easy way to get into it. But this map is great too because it's interactive and you can go and look up the map for your city and see what was written about your neighborhood or other neighborhoods in your city and how people in the 1930s were thinking about uh, the, the risk and the value of different neighborhoods. And this was something that was done everywhere in the country. And I've seen the effect personally in, in the work we've done in cities all over the country, big cities, small cities, Rust Belt, Sun Belt, it's, it's everywhere. Um, so, so to talk about where this gets to our work um, and where, where I see it happening, I wanna talk about um, uh, the narrative of what happens to the individual in this situation. So with, with redlining, uh, what those grades were doing is they were they were a series of uh, uh, it's, it's like a credit check now uh, saying whether or not you were eligible for a uh, loan and for finance access to financial institutions based on where you live and largely what you look like. But so, so the uh, the financial system that the rest of us or, or at least uh, the one that's uh, dominant this is what we think of as a normal functioning financial system looks something like this where a borrower gets money to invest in their property uh, in the form of uh, purchasing the property or making improvements uh, they pay taxes and, and fees to the local government to the schools utilities and then they get services back that property appreciates and everyone wins uh, in a red line neighborhood uh, and i you know, actually want to look at this a little more closely than I did before. Um, all those things that, that a homeowner would, would like to do suddenly becomes very difficult because you can't get insurance, you can't get a loan to make improvements. You, even if you wanted to buy a home, it, it would be very difficult because you can't get a loan. And so slowly but surely, that property deteriorates and eventually becomes a liability. What was a tax producing property that gave money to the city now becomes something that um, this, this destructive cycle of uh, tax delinquency and eventually foreclosure and vacancy, where that becomes something the city has to spend money on. So it's a double hit. And that's where we start to see it. And we take that idea and we zoom out to whole neighborhoods. We can see that the, the, uh, the neighborhoods that were graded A um, were had access to investment and were able to maintain and, and, uh, and, and appreciate their, their property values and anything that wasn't built yet greenfield development the suburbs were also you know, might as well consider those grade a oh it's a, it's a brand new uh development that yeah absolutely you can get a loan you can get insurance and this starts to to explain why we get these disparities within neighborhoods so we look at this last part of that um uh, formula when we get to this part where a property has gone through this whole process over decades and is now just left with government owned or, or otherwise uh, vacant property that now has to be maintained by the city, is owned by the city sometimes. And let's, let's see what that outcome looks like in a, in a real American city. So the, this is Kansas City, both sides. And uh, we, we had the chance to, uh, to look a little more in depth at the effect of redlining and so here's a, here's a redlining map of uh, Kansas City uh, from 1939. You can see there's a lot of red there. 
And this big red line running down through the middle of the map, that's Truist Avenue, which was a historic line of segregation. Um, like I said, there, was, there were lots of other policies in play all over the country that, that sort of um, all coalesced into redlining. One of which was at the time, there were some pretty aggressive, shall we say, uh, policies that um, dictated that uh, African-Americans weren't allowed to live uh, west of that line, west of that street. And so uh, the outcomes today in terms of race correlate really strongly with, with where redlining was done. And the other thing that we see is, is it's where we find the concentration of vacant properties. So all those brown uh, specks in there, those are all prop vacant residential properties. We did some filtering to, to take out things that were you know, big lots and big industrial sites. These are pretty much residential lots that used to have a house on them. Zoom in a little so you can really see what's going on. This is a big problem, both in terms of it's it's not a healthy sign for the functioning of a city, but it's also um, that's all potential tax revenue that's been lost. So here here it is throughout both cities. Uh, Kansas City has a strange, um, fairly strange uh, city boundary. Um, we call it the Fighting Gumby. And there's uh, about three square miles of this stuff in the Kansas side and about seven square miles in the Missouri side. So that's 10 square miles of what used to be tax producing uh, uh, property. It's also 10 square miles of where people used to live. And so when we look at the, the redlining in conjunction with property values, uh, we see a definite correlation between the outcomes of uh, property value and the grading in 1939. So you can see there's a stair step effect and it, and it helps too that Kansas City in, in the Midwest is, is such a, a rectilinear place. But you can see those steps going from an average value per acre of just $173,000 per acre up to uh, 1.8 million. And it's important to keep in mind this value per acre, not straight value. So that's not suggesting that's a $173 house in the redlined area with uh, something like uh, 10 units to an acre that's uh, something like a tenth of that. So we're really talking more like $20,000 houses. So here's Kansas City, Kansas, uh, where the redlining maps were particularly um, uh, aggressive. Um, I think I, I, I want to point out to you, I took this out because there was another deeper explanation of redlining, but but I really encourage people to go look at those maps and see what it really says about these. And, and it's I think it's worth saying these were explicitly race based, that when you go and you look at some of these neighborhoods, they'll say things like, you know, this this neighborhood is a bad investment because um, African Americans are moving there or Jewish people live there or it's riffraff. Um, that some of them are, are kind of bonkers. Anyways, the, uh, the the staircase effect is not quite as, as uh, uh, clear here, but there's, de there's a definite suppression of value. I think what's notable is that neighborhood to the uh, to the east facing on the Kansas City, Missouri side, that even though it's redlined, it's coming in at $4.6 million per acre. And, and you know, that shows that it's not a foregone conclusion. The deck becomes stacked against these neighborhoods, but through hard work and and perseverance and really fighting uphill, the people in that neighborhood managed to, to maintain their values. So here's all of the uh, broken teeth or uh, missing residential vacant land in Kansas City, Kansas. You can see there's a predominance of it. And as I said before, there's, a, there's this destructive cycle of disinvestment that the last stop on the, the, the tour before you get to vacancy is tax delinquency. And so here's all the tax delinquent properties. So you can see that they basically surround the vacants. So you can think of that as, as a, the, the um, diseased property that could become dead if we don't do something about it. So let's take a closer look at this little blue area, which is, uh, uh, I think about a square kilometer. So all of these uh, highlighted in brown, these are all vacant lots. Uh, and you can see there's a mixture of houses and not houses. So you can imagine um, at one point in time, maybe 50 years ago, these were all filled in. Uh, and so now, you know, as we as we know, they, they, these, this is a cost for the city. It's certainly not producing a lot of revenue. So the average cost for these lots is about $400, and there's about 700 of them in this square. So altogether, they're worth about $300,000.
Now, if we look at the ones that are that are occupied, we get an idea of what that difference in value is. So that's so it's seventeen thousand dollars per lot for the ones that are occupied, which is very low, but it's still forty times as much as the vacant ones. So one of the things right off the bat that that tells me is that there's a tremendous value in doing whatever you can to backstop those existing occupied lots to keep them from becoming vacant. You gotta, you gotta push push that cycle in the other direction. And so uh, here, here's the redlining map for that area. And one of the things that's uh, really great about having these digitized is that they did record a lot of other information that would have been relevant to evaluating risk at the time, not all of which was just race. Some of it uh, at least gives us a record of things like the, the rents at the time period, the price of homes. So I took that to do a little experiment. So we have uh, current prices at $1,000 to $2,000. We'll take $2,000 as the average. And so let's just take that that home value from 1937 adjusted for inflation and imagine what would have happened if this neighborhood stayed attacked, how much stayed intact, how much tax revenue would Kansas City have received? So adjusted for inflation at 2018 when we did this is $36,000, still a very modest price for a home. Uh, but the total total value of that would have been about $26 million. Uh, and so we'll just round that up and, and say uh, $30 million lost over 82 years. And so this starts to give us a picture of why this, if we connect the dots, this racist policy ends up being a tremendous expense for cities decades later. And so all it would take is 18 houses, even if that low value of $17,000, to double the entire tax production of this area, of this neighborhood. Uh, the dilemma is it would be very difficult to get a bank loan, a regular Bank of America bank loan for a $17,000 house. So that presents the challenge and the opportunity for us to figure out how can we be creative in a neighborhood like this to get houses built, to increase city tax revenue, to stabilize the neighborhood. And honestly, I'd say, say there's a pretty clear need for this, pretty clear need to uh, uh, provide housing for people. Plus, all of the infrastructure, all the pipes and the roads that went into to supplying and uh, supporting this development when it was occupied, that's all still there and it all still costs money. So it's really an imperative for cities. And in Kansas City, is, it's kind of a, an extreme example, but it's not an unusual example. This is true all throughout the country, at least in some capacity. So I'm going to take switch gears and talk about Minneapolis for a second. So this is the uh, Minneapolis uh, 3D tax model, or it's Minneapolis within Hennepin County. And one of the things that we were able to do there is we uh, they engaged us in a project to look at the change in value over time. As, uh, Minneapolis is a, a great case study because it it, um, it grew in population and then went through a lot of the deindustrialization, de depopulation that a lot of Rust Belt cities went through but it's actually recovered. And so now I, I see Minneapolis as kind of a case study for what I think could and will happen to a lot of other cities in America when they start to recover population and, and become more prosperous again and have to readdress a lot of the questions that didn't really get answered a long time ago. One of which is if we look at this, so what's going on here is everything blue is property that's gained value. So anyone who owns property who's listening to this, somewhere in the back of their mind is a little voice that says, uh, please God, let my property retain its value and at least you know, hopefully appreciate. Um, it's important to us as, as property owners. It's the primary uh, a way that Americans have built wealth. Well, if we look in the in the uh, uh, northwest quadrant of Minneapolis, which was uh, which was a red line neighborhood, which is uh, predominantly uh, African American. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, even in a city that's gaining population, that there's, there's spots throughout the city that have lost value and or are tax delinquent. But the, the concentration of property value loss in that quadrant is pretty clear. This is a problem. This is something that, that, that we have to figure out how to address, both for the human cost, but also literally for the city cost. And so I thought this was fun. We're all, we're all um, um, teachers now. And we're all we're all in the, in the position of being online teachers, so I thought I'd do a little worksheet. I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wait a minute here and and let you at home uh, yell at your your computers whether or not you've you've spotted the difference. But 
I'll just go ahead and tell you um, the difference is right there. So what I did is I, I took the highway out of Minneapolis, just went, got in my time machine and went back and, and kept it from being built. And, and this is what, this is a very conservative idea of what that value would look like. Um, and so I'll also let you guess about how much money we're talking about, especially since Joe just showed his example. But my very conservative estimate was about $655 million. So it's 160 acres of prime uh, urban land. Now we did another experiment. This is uh, this this is the kind of green uh, uh, infill that is is um, I, I'm seeing throughout Minneapolis. There's a lot of this going on along the uh, the Greenway uh, in Uptown, just one after another of these like six to seven story buildings, uh, and then also around the university. So if that's the kind of new stuff that's getting built, if we took that as an example at 11 million dollars per acre, then we'd be talking more in the range of 1.8 billion. That's also the kind of uh, idea we would get for value if that highway were, were to go away now and be replaced by new development. And the reason and I bring this up, Josh, just for uh, just for reference for everybody, the whole entire city is only worth 40 billion. So that's yeah. you know two tenths of the entire city's value right there. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's a pretty critical location. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, downtown Minneapolis is very valuable. So. Um, and, and the reason that, that I bring this up in the midst of a redlining conversation is because there's a direct connection. So when this is this is uh, my reconstruction of of uh, the, the neighborhood of, the, of downtown Minneapolis and the surrounding neighborhoods as it could have been without the highway. Here's the redlining map. And so one of the things that happened, both intentionally and less intentionally, was either when they drew these maps, they said, "Okay, those are the parts of our city that are problematic." let's replace them with highways or hospitals or parks or pavement, urban renewal. Or by the time that they were ready to build something like that, they looked at the city and said, okay, where are the property values really low and where can we get away with tearing things down? Well, it, it invariably was in the redlined areas. So you can see how much of D5 was just literally torn out. And when you do that, it's not like the properties on the side of that highway fare well. So it creates this, this zone of destruction around it. So finally, the the idea that I want to I want to leave us with is uh, if we can imagine uh, you can you can see the parts of Minneapolis that are redlined. If we can imagine taking those values up to being uh, uh, baseline with the rest of the city, but without displacing the people who who live there, how do we get creative to try and figure out a way to do that? Okay, and so. Those are all the, the slides I have. I'm gonna have other stuff, but I think I think that's the end of the uh, redlining stuff I had prepared. No, that's that's great, Josh. Um, there there is there was a question from uh, uh, Gladys, and I want to make sure that um, that it was covered. I, she asked a question about uh, Minneapolis um, before you started up, so um, hopefully that covered her question. Uh, Gladys, if you have other questions or if we didn't hit it. Um, feel free to just uh, type into the questions. Um, and jo Josh, I want to ask you. I want. I want to ask you a question um, because we've had this discussion uh, before. And 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 um, you know, I think you raise a you raise a good point about the fact of of not just seeing these as as individual um, policies to to address, but but that whole spectrum of how it's all tied together that. You know, urban renewal went after areas that were quote blighted, and the findings of blight were all vacant land and and all that. But yet, we have to look at it in the context of for a full what was it, 30, 40 years, we undermined the ability for folks to have proper investment in in the in their communities. Um, do you have ideas as far as? You know, what would be the method of undoing all of this, or or is there is it just more of a practice of identification? Yeah, um, it's a big question, but it's it's kind of a fun one. Um, yeah, yeah. So so when I look at those neighborhoods, you know, I think I think yes, absolutely. First of all, I think uh, we have to to look at all this area, um, look at the red line neighborhoods, and and really quantify what happened so that we can make a clear case that. It's kind of like an invisible natural disaster. 
like if if uh, if these neighborhoods had been hit by a tornado um in fact literally literally one of them in minneapolis was hit by a tornado and and the, the crazy thing is we saw this in the data is is it hurt the property values but the redlining hurt them worse like they were already in decline and the thing is is, is most of those policies officially ended decades ago but what we set in motion is is the mechanism of of uh, well this we we graded this neighborhood bad a long time ago for bad unfair reasons but then it just was economically bad and we could say well quantitatively it's economically bad so we won't invest there so we've distanced ourselves from from that initial reason that that this neighborhoods were singled out and we just have to uh, get people to see that and understand it i think and then in these neighborhoods I think there's a lot of interesting things that could be done. I, I like to daydream, I mean, I daydream about this a lot, especially with $300 lots. I mean, I kind of want to buy one. And, and you know, what, what, if, what if you had a, a you know, I think, I think there's going to have to be a lot of experimentation. So what if a city uh, took, a, took one block of those vacant units and uh, got low cost loans to people and set it up in a way that, uh, that, um, it was uh, if we treated it like a tiff and what if we kept the values low or, and, and I think at some point once the investment gets there and once there's a working sort of anchor of, of stable value we'll start to see that effect spread throughout the rest because the thing is a lot of these neighborhoods are also they have the characteristics that um, that are really desirable in the real estate market high walkability sidewalks close to downtown all these great things infrastructure is already in place highly developable um, it's just a matter of figuring out how to make the capital connect one, one of the questions that i hear from folks a lot is um well that's fine joe you just want to raise value everywhere which was which is going to increase um uh, gentrification um how how would how would I, I know you know how i respond but just for the audience how would you address address issues of, of gentrification and what happened in the conversations yeah. on the panels that you were in about that yeah um it's a big word gentrification and i think it encapsulates a lot of i think it gets so heated because it encapsulates or it, it, it connects so many big existential issues for the united states and what, what a lot of gentrification for me comes back to is is our, our failure as a society in the past to deal with integration that in the past, when faced with different people coming to our city, and, and large, and you know, honestly, a big part of it is, is African Americans moving to new cities in, in the United States, rejecting that idea, and and ending up with uh, with neighborhoods of of um, of poverty. And now we have this problem again of of people with more wealth moving back into cities, and and uh, you know there is a real threat of displacement again but i think uh, when we look at the, the 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 evidence and we look at the numbers um persistent urban poverty is a lot worse than gentrification but that doesn't mean that that, that displacement is good either i think the, the the big uh the big fat unfair deal is is to say when i have that that graph that's why in the the uh, presentation with that graphic is we, we do want the values to go up and I want the people who live there who've been shut out of that opportunity, I want them to be part of it. Um, and so we, we just have to, to you know, figure out how to do that and we have to sort of dissect the current model of American capital and, and investment. I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, and income inequality. I think that whenever I hear about gentrification, I, I, I think the other thing that, that doesn't come up enough to me is uh, is that there are two sides of that equation, the cost of housing and the income people have. And I I don't I don't know how cities can how much cities can do to fix that, but I think it's a symptom of the extreme income inequality that we are stuck with in our cities. Well, and I think it it brings forward or you raise the issue of basically the the thesis of of urban three, which is, you know, listen to the to the feedback of what's happening, but also seek through the math of what's the underlying problem. 
um, you know, it, it is matters of integration. Actually, if you go back to those redlining maps, one of the things that and I encourage everybody on the call to go and pull your own community or nearby community if you can find it on that website. And I posted the websites on the chat box uh, for um, uh, Mapping Inequality, but also uh, Richard Rothstein's book. Um, so just go into the chat bot, bot button if you want to pull that. But when you go and pull the redlining maps, they actually call it infiltration of of races. So that 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 matter of our, you know, as much as we're an open melting pot, we do have a difficult time blending um, uh, racially in our in our uh, in our cities and at a local level. But but I, I do want it for everybody on the on the webinar. Just bear in mind that that we're all shareholders in our cities, and that wealth building in cities should be for everyone, um, and not for certain individuals to have better access to that wealth building than others. And I think of that. As long as we're conscious of that in our conversations about uh, gentrification and, and that point that you brought, raised, Josh, of making sure that the rising tide raises all boats and not just certain boats that have access to better policies or better capital or being able to pay to get through a permit process. You know, sometimes even the zoning process or how we do approvals in our community can be in inequitous because a lot of people can't hire an architect, a landscape architect, a planner, and a, a landscape or, or a, a real estate attorney, a zoning attorney, a planner to get through a process. You know, it's we have to look at our own policies as as part of the problem as well. Um, no one's asking questions, so I'm just yeah, going to throw. So we do have a couple yeah. questions. So. Okay. Yeah. So the first one is from Amy Strother, and she asks, "How do I network with individuals who would like to invest in KCK and KCMO? She's from there, and she's desperate to rebuild." Um, so, um, I would start with Abby Kinney. Um, she's she works at Gould Evans, um, and I know Abby's involved with trying to start an incremental developer uh, group there uh, to 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 pool people. Um, Josh, I don't know if you've bumped into anybody else in the the KC area, but that's or done it straight no, as well. I, Talk to them. Yeah, I know on the Kansas. I know on the Kansas side. Um, um, uh, rebuilding those vacant lots is a big priority for the mayor and and for the the, the government there so so the, i know there are existing programs to help do that if it, they have it's kind of cool they have some programs in both both sides of kansas city that, that basically tr have the powers of tiff but for uh building residential in, in these old redlined areas and i don't know i don't really know the details of those but i know there's there's impulse there and i i bet i bet if if uh you went to the city and 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 talked found someone to talk to you that that, that uh, there would be encouraging um policy there, there's something going on to, to help do that another question that came in um was how can we look at maps similar to the minneapolis example for our own cities comparing redlined areas to the current value per acre well what city do we want? <laughs> well, the the easiest way is, uh, you know, from a, you know, pull pull your red line map, or I don't know if the if the questioner could put their city. Yeah, Josh, walk through Durham because you live there, and what you would do in this situation. Yeah, and I don't know from the question whether the, you know. C, C city does it explicitly say with the value per acre? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, well you, you have to have that. I did what I did in preparation for doing this is is stuff which I wanted to do in a long time is I went back and used the maps for mapping inequality to um, grab uh, cities that that we've done previously. And like I said, I've seen this uh, at this point. I can open one of these models and pretty well tell you what was redlined without seeing even knowing what city it is, but this is Durham, North Carolina, and one of the things I think is, is the, one of the things that, that will uh, will throw you off in looking at this is that there's an issue of time, and in a lot of cases, because cities have, have gone through some revitalization and because we're starting to pay attention to to uh, these parts of the city again in, in, in a lot of cities, there's new stuff that looks really good. So you see those big red spikes in the middle of Durham there. Those are those are new construction that's built in the last few years. Uh, and you can also see there's just a big gap where you can see right through the property, right, right to uh, 
the underlying map, and that's because a highway was plowed through. That that area, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, D6, where that big red spike is and the, the big gap, that was Haiti, which was a uh, um, prosperous uh, African-American community in Durham, a uh, very like, middle-class uh, community. Um, Durham was it was had an area that's known as Black Wall Street. There's the first um, uh, African-American-owned uh, insurance company it's based in Durham. Um, and the highway was plowed right through that, I think in 1954. And the, the um, North Carolina uh, uh, lunch counter sit-ins were in 1953. So suspicious timing, maybe. Josh, Josh uh, the, the question came in from uh, Daniel Jeffries and he cited uh, the city of Tulsa, which is actually an interesting parallel to what happened in Durham. but. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure more more folks are aware of the the race uh, riots that happened um, in uh, in Tulsa now. Um, oh, I can only imagine what the what the what the effect on, on on property would would be there. I mean, it was literally literally blown up. Well, that and that it happened also, in the also before redlining too. Yeah, That's that took 20s. that took place in the 20s. Redlining was basically from 1932 ish, uh, basically say mid 30s to 1960. They technically stopped doing it in 1960, but then in you know in the 60s is when they just kind of flipped over onto urban renewal policies. But for Tulsa, it goes further back because uh, you know Tulsa had one of the most um, just awful uh, um, uh, attacks on the African American community. The massacre. It was a massacre. Yeah, it was basically. And, and for those that, that aren't aware of it, please look up what uh, the, 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 the riots in Tulsa from the 1920s and it's mind blowing. Uh, there's actually a really good um, uh, video that Vox put out about the history of it. But yeah, as far as, far as these models, I'm trying to figure out a good way to, uh, to publish these uh, so that, that folks can uh, uh, look at them and explore them and, and see, that, see that relationship between uh, redlining and, and outcomes and value. Well, it, it just if you want to do it yourself, I mean, you, there's we call it sometimes it's just like you can just go into the assessor's website and just grab a few properties yeah. um, and just do it. As, you know, if you don't have access to GIS um, or you don't under you know don't know how to use QGIS or other kind of uh, web softwares, you can just go into the assessor's files, pull the property, pull the valuation, divide it by the acres, and just grab a handful of of, of examples um, in different districts. Uh, to be able to come up with a just an idea of what happens, you don't have to go full GIS, although it really is powerful to see it in GIS. Kate, is there another question? We're reaching. We've got two more minutes. Or Josh, are you going to take us to take us to Tulsa? Yeah, there's one last question while Josh is navigating. Have you ever done studies on how large non-taxable institutions like universities, hospitals, et cetera, buying property and the effect it has on tax revenues, property values, and income inequality? Um, it's going to depend on the place. We did an analysis in Gainesville um, where the city is actively uh, working with the university, but also being mindful of issues of equity and inclusion and uh, reinvestment. Um, so the, the, the city, and we can send the report on that. I think I should, I think I might have a video of that. Uh, but, you know, in the case of, in the case of Gainesville, uh, much like in the case of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where Josh used to live, the, the, the interface or the membrane between the, um, the community and the, the college or institution actually becomes a point of uh, a, a very valuable real estate because there's the commerce, the, the you know the the restaurants, the bars, and all that that come close to the university, and all those students need a place to shop. So the rents and values tend to be pretty high, even though the, the university is non-taxable. Um, we're doing a, a project in uh, Ramsey County right now, and Ramsey has you know what Josh, 12 different colleges. It's kind of insane, um, and some of those colleges interface better with the with the university or with the community than others where it's just purely like a commuter college with this kind of blast zone of strip malls around it. Um, so, yeah. it, you know, the, the institutions can be benefiting or they can be draining depending on how they're designed, but go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I think um, I think what we're seeing in, in, in the last um, 
it varying degrees in the last you know, 15 years is is there a lot of there are a lot of communities in this country that the, the the big university or big university and hospital have become the mill in some cases there was literally a mill and the mill was gone but durham's a good example um oh, washington duke and and the cigarette factory and then the cigarette factory paid for the university university paid for the hospital and the hospital is the big business um how those institutions uh, interact with their city i think is starting to change and, they, and those institutions have figured out that as we're in the past, they wanted to sequester themselves from the city. Now they're realizing that they need to invest in those cities if they're going to be successful. At least the smart ones are. And um, and having a, a good, both a good relationship, but also being a, a good benefactor is is you know that's that's it should be a marriage, not not a you know oppositional relationship. And uh, Josh, I'm going to go ahead and take over screen and just. Uh... We're at we're a two o'clock uh, point, or actually 201. So I just want to thank everybody for- um, that's, that's me. That's a picture of me doing the doing the model. So when Josh actually cuts his beard. Um, but uh, put, put your models on your maps. You know, just basically find a way to visualize this stuff. Uh, do the math in your community. Even start small, pick parcels here and there, but just start getting the exercise of of not being intimidated by the by the mathematics. There's several books that cover our work and our process. Uh, we'll continue to do these labs. Um, and our, our intention is to do them all through COVID. So we have them every month. Uh, come back on the 27th. Uh, feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, you'll see that we uh, will post, uh, I think, uh, we'll post a, a copy to the link of the videos in the chat section with those books if you want to copy those out real quick. Um, but it's July 27th is our next one at one o'clock. Feel free to share uh, this invite to elected officials, friends, planners, whoever you want. Um, if, if you want to work with us uh, on a project, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to our colleague Kate um, Riba. Um, on the left, she handles, uh, she's our projects director and can help work out a scope and proposal. If you're interested in having me do a webinar or a lecture in your community or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to our colleague, Caitlin Nellis Masters, and she can get that organized for you. So thank you for your time, and um, hopefully we'll see you in a month. Take care and be safe, everybody.